It's deer season in Springfield, Illinois, and someone has made a killing. A couple gentlemen who live out in the eastern part of the county, one was driving home, saw something laying in a creek area off the side of a road. He figures it's a discarded deer carcass and keeps driving, but for some reason he can't let it go. So he goes home, sits there for a while, and it, it's, it's bugging him, so he calls one of his friends and they agree to go down there and, and see what they have. The area is dark and wooded. It's hard to make out in the tall grass. Then they see it. And it's not a dead deer. And that's when they discovered um, uh, the remains of a body. Or what's left of it. it appeared to be a body missing the head. Horrified, the men dial 911. Sagamon County Chief Deputy Joe Roche gets the call from dispatch. I was at home, I was off duty. The captain of investigations is never off duty. But I received a call and we believe that we had a body of a human found in a rural area. When investigators arrive, they discover a gruesome scene. It's very graphic. When, when I, along with other detectives, walked up, it was um, the decapitated body and the, the body also didn't have arms or legs, so someone had cut the head, the arms, and the legs off this person. Even the most hardened detectives are taken aback by the sheer carnage of the crime scene. This is unheard of for the area. Yes, it's, it's a very safe area. Uh, the only thing that happens out there is farming and hunting. The first hurdle for investigators is to ID the body. There are no missing persons reports, and the body is just a torso, making the identification process nearly impossible. We had no fingerprints, we had no face, and no way to actually do any tests. So detectives on scene scour the area for any signs of the man's identity. Then they spot something on a nearby guardrail. You could see what appeared to be a uh, substance consistent with blood where something was drug over the, the railing. And there was also a extension cord around the shoulders, which appeared that uh, the torso was drugged down there by someone. But the clues don't stop there. It appears someone tried to wipe the blood off the guardrail. There was uh, napkins. And mixed within the bloody napkins on the ground, we found a receipt just feet away from the body. Got with their loss prevention people, tracked down the purchase time, date, uh, got the register. And there's more. When cops pull the store's surveillance video and zero in on the purchase time on the receipt, that's when they spot the mystery buyer. But it was a black female. And just what was she buying? Purchasing a sawzall at basically midnight. Buying a sawzall in the middle of the night, it's a little bit unusual. Police in Springfield, Illinois are literally trying to piece together the grisly murder mystery. A body is discovered, but many parts are missing. An African-American male torso missing the legs from below the knee down. The hands were cut off the arms and the head had been severed off the body. Cops find a store receipt near the man's torso, and when they pull the retail shop security video, they discover a woman making a curious purchase in the middle of the night. On that receipt was a skill reciprocating saw, which is an electric sawzall. Then cops hit pay dirt when they zoom in. The surveillance video shows the mystery woman paying with a credit card. So you had surveillance video and you had the card that was used and what items were purchased. Yes. And when cops pull the woman's credit card information, the secret shopper is a secret no more. Her name? Watasha Dent McCaster. But she's hardly a criminal. Was a student at a local college uh, and had no criminal history. Um, recently moved to the area. In fact, the 22-year-old was an honor student at her high school. And when not excelling at school, Watasha could be found attending church. Lots of friends uh, dedicated to her family as well. Uh, never heard a bad thing about her either. Just the all-American kid. 
But considering everything, investigators placed the college student under round-the-clock, 24-hour surveillance. We put a surveillance on her house. She went about her normal life. Including something fairly routine as taking out the trash. After she deposited on the curb. That made her trash public property. Cops move in right away and secretly seize her garbage. And when they open the first bag. Floor tile. She tore up the floor tile. So again, an, an odd thing to find in trash. Odd, but not necessarily incriminating. Still, investigators send the tiles to the crime lab for testing. Cops wonder if this young church-going woman was just remodeling her house or if she had some connection to this savage murder. How could this petite, meek, mild-mannered, no criminal history have done this? Not to mention the killing is so brutal it seems more like a hit. This has to be gang-related, drug-related, folks not from Sangamon County that could do this heinous crime. Because your people just don't do this here. We do not see this type of crime here in Sangamon County. While the coroner attempts to identify the butchered remains, undercover cops keep a close eye on Watasha and CSI teams continue to sift through her trash. Then alarm bells go off. One bag doesn't appear to be garbage at all. It's full of men's clothing. When we started seeing soldiers uniforms, we knew that there was um, someone that could have been living there with her. But who? It's a short-lived question when investigators discover an identification card mixed in with the uniforms. Norman Rimmel McCaster was um, a citizen of Sangamon County. He was involved in the Illinois National Guard and a great member of this community. And there's something else about this National Guardsman. Had recently moved to Springfield, Illinois with his wife, Watasha Denton McCaster. That's right, Watasha is married, but her husband doesn't seem to be home. Detectives place a call to the Illinois National Guard. They are informed that Norman was a no-show at a recent mandatory drill. Cops decide it's time to have a chat with his young wife. Uh, she talked to myself and Sergeant Vos. Uh, we asked if we'd come in and talk to her. She let us in. She was uh, very polite. Now, was she acting suspiciously? Not at all. She invited us into her house, was uh, very genuine, sweet, asked us if we wanted something to drink. We sat on her couch, talked a few things over. Watasha explains to police that Norman is her high school sweetheart, but that lately their marriage has been on the rocks due to his drug addiction. She told us that he left with some druggies from St. Louis. We asked her what kind of car. She didn't know. Uh, I remember specifically asking her what did, he, what did he have when he left? She said just the clothes on his back. But when detectives talk to Norman's dad, he's in total shock. He tells police his son doesn't do drugs, and what's more, he has no idea his son is even missing. So you're telling me my son ran off. So you must don't know my son and the relationship that me and him have. He's not going to run off. He's going to call him. Right, without telling me or calling me. Turns out, after Norman disappeared, Watasha didn't tell his family or police. She didn't report her husband missing. Norman's aunt Keisha is equally stunned by Watasha's stories about her nephew. She starts saying all weird stuff that didn't make sense. You knew it wasn't right. No, I know it was not right. I know he would have contacted us and told us anything that was going on. And when detectives interview soldiers and co-workers who knew the missing 22-year-old man... And we were waiting to hear one bad thing about him, and that, that never happened. Then cops get their hands on more surveillance footage. Just one day after buying the saw, Watasha is captured pulling into the same store parking lot. Once inside, security cameras roll as she makes another strange purchase. Cleaning supplies, um and I, th I think it was um, like heavy duty plastic that you'd wrap maybe for painting, like a, a plastic covering. Basically a kill cleanup kit. That's what we thought it was. At least it was very suspicious that the same person that used his credit card was also cleaning up, ripping the tile out of her house. And not reporting your husband and missing. And not reporting your husband missing. 
Now, with more than a little hunch to go on, investigators contact the Illinois National Guard and make a very specific request. They ask for a sample of Norman's DNA. Since he was in the National Guard, there is a DNA sample that is kept at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. So through the work of the Illinois State Police, taking a DNA sample from the torso, matching that up with DNA from Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. And the result? It was a match. There's a DNA match between the torso found in the woods and the missing soldier. It's 22-year-old National Guardsman Norman McCaster. Just received that phone call. It just tears you. It just tears you apart. That you know, to hear that one of your kids is dead. What did you hear had happened at that time? Nobody wanted to tell me. People just said, "Don't say anything to him." But when Norman's father arrives at the police station in Springfield, the detectives regretfully reveal the savage way Norman died. Once I found out all the details, I pretty much wanted to hurt something or someone. Whoever was responsible. Who was ever responsible for it. And investigators believe they know who is responsible for Norman's death his own wife, Watasha. They've had her under surveillance for weeks. We wanted to gather the strongest case we could get against her. Now, armed with what appears to be undeniable evidence against her, Detective Vos asked Watasha to come down to the sheriff's headquarters. The Thanksgiving holiday was coming up. We thought she might go home and not come back. Watasha agrees to meet with investigators. We were uh, helping the guard out on a missing person who, according to them, is a missing person, Norm. That's why we came to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And we briefly spoke at your house, and you were nice enough to come over here with us, right? Detectives ask Watasha about her relationship with her husband. She paints a picture of estrangement and abuse, starting with an argument over Norman watching porn. It just threw me into the wall, and I got so nervous because you know, that's my husband, you know, right. and he never put his hands on me like that. How long ago was that? That was about like, to me, two months ago. Then detectives recall something odd they noticed at her house during their initial conversation with the young woman. And now it's starting to make sense. There was a calendar on the wall in the kitchen with the anniversary date all blacked out. Their two year anniversary was coming up and Norman McCaster was not going to make that two-year anniversary, and she was going to make sure of it. So Detective Vos asks a leading question. Hey, you said your anniversary was Monday. I can't remember when you said it was. It was on the 6th. It would have made two years we've been married, and I kicked him out on the 24th. Like, he actually left to call his stuff on the 24th. All of his stuff? Remember, cops already went through Watasha's trash. They found what appeared to be Norman's belongings, including his military uniforms, credit cards, and IDs. And when, when he left, what did he take? Everything. Everything? Detective Vos has just caught Watasha in a lie. You told us at your house that he left with nothing but the clothes on his back. Yeah, I mean, he got everything. Did he? Yeah. I don't keep anything. I don't want to keep anything. Well, you know why you didn't? You threw it all out in your garbage. That's why we're here. We know where Norman's at. Where is he? You know where Norman's at. No, I don't. Detective Vos hands her two search warrants, one for her home and one for a sample of her DNA. If we haven't made ourselves clear, this is a homicide, okay? What's a homicide? Watasha might not know what a homicide is, but cops believe she committed one and placed her under arrest. Are you under arrest or something? Yeah. I'm under arrest. Yep. You're under arrest for the concealment of a homicide. There's nothing more 
question I'd like to do is get this straightened out, okay? I want a lawyer. Pardon me? I want a lawyer. You want a lawyer? Okay. Watasha is taken into custody and charged with first-degree murder, dismembering a body, concealing a homicidal death, and obstructing justice. At trial, prosecutors reveal the results of a forensic computer search performed on her laptop. The computer searches, they all started around the beginning of June, about how to kill your husband, how to kill a spouse and get away with it, and the list goes on and on. And on to these curious clicks of her computer keyboard. How to kill somebody with Visine. Which, according to prosecutors, would explain the puzzling contents of one of Watasha's trash bags. We found numerous bottles of Visine. I've, I've been involved in law enforcement for over 20 years. At the time, we didn't even know what relevance that was. But we found out, you know, people take the, the component of Visine and ingest that in the human body in large quantities, it can be fatal. A forensic toxicologist testifies that he discovered above normal levels of tetrahydrosoline, an ingredient in Visine, in Norman McCaster's liver. But prosecutors are just getting started when they call their star witness a student who attended college with Watasha. He loaned a gun to Watasha she, th she then returned a day later, and it was missing two bullets. We believe that she shot Norman in the head with that gun. That's why his head was cut off with a reciprocating saw, and then his hands were cut off and his legs cut off. Either she thought that, that no fingerprints could be found, so they couldn't determine uh, who, when the torso was found, who it was, or it made it easier because Norman weighed over 200 pounds. Uh, easier for her to move Norman. But cops believe she still had to use a dolly. That theory comes from more damning surveillance footage. This time, it's from an entirely different store where Watasha is seen purchasing a dolly, then placing a truly chilling order. A chest freezer that was later canceled. Uh, we surmise that she was able to dispose of the body so she did not need to store it in a chest freezer. But what about the rest of Norman? We believed that the killer went up to Chicago based on some evidence from her phone. Um, we looked and there were several bridges, other areas, other wooded areas. So no one knows where his head, his legs, his arms are? His head, his hands, his legs were never recovered. It's a devastating reality for Norman's family members who were hoping to lay their loved one to rest in one piece. Why would someone just do something like that to a, a person, period, kill a person up like that? After seven hours of jury deliberations, Watasha is found guilty and sentenced to 78 years. That's not a, a human being to me, that's a monster. And the motive for murder? Natasha was a perfectionist. She had never failed at one thing. But her marriage was, was crumbling around her. And when it started to fail, she came up with a plan. And, and unfortunately, she carried it out. Since the horrific murder of Norman McCaster, his father tries to stay strong for the rest of the family by mourning his only son in private. It's tough because every morning, I go out to the car, I'll sit there and, you know, I'll cry because that's how much I miss. Oh, I mean, it meant a lot to me. To this day, the Springfield, Illinois woman has never admitted to killing, then dismembering and decapitating her husband. In fact, even while being arrested, Watasha was still wearing her wedding ring and told detectives she was holding out hope that she and Norman would get back together.